Welcome to the workshop. Uh, my name is Valmir. I am a Cyprus ambassador. Um, can you see my, uh, besides my screen, can you see myself as well? Because now that I am sh screen is sharing my screen, I can't see myself anymore. So please let me know if you can see me. Um, so I was explaining before that in, in this workshop, I will introduce you to migrator.cypress.io, which is this application here. Uh, and basically, migratorcypress.io is an application created by the Cypress team uh, as with educational purposes. And the idea is that it allows you to understand how a uh, test script that was created with Protractor would look like if you migrated to Cypress. So you can check it out, migrator.cypress.io. Uh, there is an example when you start the application for the first time, when you click migrate, you see the equivalent code in Cypress here. So in here you have Protractor um, syntax and in here you have the exact same thing in the Cypress site, right? And what I was saying is that for this workshop, I will present you how I tested this application using Cypress itself. And, and the way I will present it to you, it's gonna be in an unconventional way. It's gonna be maybe in a way that you might not be expecting. I hope you like the way I am going to present it. I have already done this workshop um, for, uh, in Portuguese, I'm originally from Brazil, so I speak Portuguese and I have a YouTube channel. And in there, I have done this same workshop in the way that I am going to do uh, for you here today. Um, and people pretty much liked it. So I hope you like it too. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is how you start a suite of tests and you evolve it on demand. You start adding complexity just when it's needed when the application is kind of communicating to you that it needs uh, more complexity and also when it needs you to remove the complexity. So there's someone else joining. Let me admit this new person. So we have at the moment 19 people. Uh, so welcome you all. So the project itself is available on GitHub on my profile. So I'm gonna share it with you both here in the chat on Zoom and also on Discord in case you are there. So you can come to this project on GitHub if you want. If you want, you can leave a star. You can clone, clone the project on your own computer if you want it. If you want, if you can also fork it uh, in case you want to contribute back with uh, anything else that uh, might come to your mind. And this project, I have created some documentation, like very simple documentation for you to get started. So in case you come here to github.com slash WLSF82 slash Cypress dash migrator dash tests, you'll be able to clone it. After cloning it, um, I left some pre-requirements here. Uh, so these are the versions of Node and NPM that I used when I created this project. So if you want to use it, I recommend that you use these or latest, uh, later uh, LTS versions. Um, after you cloned it, you can change the director to go inside the project that you just cloned, and then you can run NPM install. Um, after you install the dependencies, you can then run NPM test to run the tests in headless mode, which is the mode where you don't see the browser being opened. But if you want, you can also run the tests with npm run side um, up here. npm run side column open to open the Cypress app where you be able to see uh, the tests running in what is called interactive mode. The project itself is available on GitHub. So here is the application that we are going to test. And here is the project of this application. So if you want to come here, leave a star as well, clone the project, fork, do whatever you want. Uh, so this project is open source, the Cypress Migrator. You can clone it and you can set up it locally if you want to have the project running locally instead of using the version that is running in the internet, okay? 
Um, and in case you want to run the same tests against your local environment, I have created an NPM script as well for you, which is NPM run test local, or you can open the Cypress app to run them in interactive mode against your local environment as well with NPM run, side column open, column local. And after you run the tests in headless mode, this is the summary of the results where in my computer here, uh, the time I created this documentation, it took 51 seconds to run 31 tests, which is what we have. Um, if you want to know more about me, there, there is my, the link to my website here. And in my website, you find uh, a little bit about myself. It's kind of a timeline where you can find link to my courses on Udemy. I have uh, courses on Udemy about Cyprus and about other technologies. I have both in English and in Portuguese as well. You can find my profile on GitHub, my YouTube channel. Most of the content on my YouTube channel are in Portuguese since I am originally from Brazil and Portuguese is my mother language. But there is one uh, playlist called English content where I interview other Cyprus ambassadors and people from the Cyprus team. I even had interviewed uh, Gleb Bahmutov, which is the ex-VP of engineering at Cyprus. Um, here you will also find my Twitter profile, LinkedIn, Medium, and Dev community. So uh, yeah, feel free to like uh, from this project here, uh, which I shared both on Discord and also here in the chat, you have access to the Cypress Migrator app. The link is here in the readme, to the project on GitHub as well, and to my website in the footer here. All right. So to get started, what I want to show you is like, what does it do, right? So for instance, uh, the this Cypress Migrator project here, it basically allows you to, and let me let me restart. The focus of today's workshop is not going to be on migrating commands from Protractor to Cypress. It's going to be on what I call evolutionary architecture for your test suite. Okay. And the migrator is just the application that will be testing. But it's important to understand what the application does. So I'm going to give you just a uh, sneak peek of that. So when you access it for the first time, as I showed you before, it has a test suite here written in Protractor syntax. So it describes Cypress docs. Uh, then it has a test case. It should show the correct title, the correct site title and redirect URL. Then there is the command that visits the page uh, with browser.driver.get passes the URL as an argument of this get command, then runs the assertions, expect browser.get title to equal why Cypress, uh, pipe Cypress documentation, and also expect browser.get current URL to equal to the URL uh, docs.cypress.io slash guides slash overview slash why Cypress. When you click migrate, you see the equivalent here in Cypress where you see that Instead of browser.driver.get, we have a site.visit. Instead of expect browser.get title to equal, we have site.title should equal and the text that we want it to be equal. So here should, in this case, is receiving two arguments, equal as the first one and the second, what we want it to, to be equal. And then instead of expect browser.get URL, a current URL to equal to the URL, we have side of location, get the eight href, and it should equal to this URL here. All right. So we can, uh, for instance, uh, type something else here in, in Protractor. We would have something like element by uh, element, sorry, by CSS. And then we could pass, for instance, uh, a tag, a. If I migrate this to Cypress, it would be simply a site.get or an anchor tag, right? So one thing that you will notice uh, that I find nice is that Cypress syntax is much shorter than Protractor syntax. So you notice that in most of the cases, the command that we have in the right is 
shorter than the command in the left, meaning that the Cypress commands are shorter than the protractor commands. If you have arrived uh, uh, late in, for the workshop, don't worry, this, the workshop is being recorded and you have access to the recording afterwards. Um, so this is the application that we are going to test, right? And actually I have already created the whole test suite in this URL that I have already shared with you both on Zoom and also on um, and also on Discord. And so we'll see here that it has in the package.json scripts to run the tests in interactive mode and interactive mode locally, where I am overwriting the base URL to the base URL of the local environment in case you're running locally. We will be running against the version on internet. And we have also scripts to run the tests headless, both uh, against the production environment and also the local host environment. And finally, this project in the final version, which is the version that I'm showing you at the moment, it's using Cypress 11. 0.1, which was recently uh, launched. And it's using also this lib that I have created, which is called side-press, uh, which adds one silly custom command, which is the press command. So you can chain a, uh, for instance, you can do side.get, get an input of type text, type my name, for instance, Valmir, dot press enter. For instance, this is like it allows it adds this dot press command basically. Um, other than that, we have the cypress.config.json, the cypress.config.js file, where the only thing I'm configuring here is the base URL to https column slash slash migrator.cypress.io. This application here, this is why. When I am running locally, I overwrite the configuration. All right. Um, what else? On the Cypress director, we have three different directors. We have uh, support, where in here I'm basically importing my library from um, that I have that that is defined in the package.json that when I when I install the dependencies with, with npm install it it's sent to the node modules directory and for some reason there were uncouch exceptions in this application so I have to add this line here as well um, and then I'm not gonna look into the end to end and fixtures for now because you see it uh, in a moment but basically in here we have one Oops, one test, migrator.site.js. And in the fixtures, we have test scenarios.js. Okay. But I said to you that I'm going to present this project to you in an unconventional way. Um, let me see. It seems that there's more people waiting to join. So let's admit them as well. So for you, that has. Um, arrived late don't worry the workshop is being recorded and you have access to it afterwards so you can watch what you have missed uh because we have already started for a few uh, a few minutes ago um and if you have any questions you don't need to wait until the end of the workshop you can ask questions uh, beforehand i'll be uh, while showing you things here i'm gonna be looking both to the chat here on Zoom and also on Discord, uh, in case you prefer to use Discord instead of uh, Zoom for chatting. Uh, so I'll be in both here. Uh, I just put them both in my other screen now so I can watch to both of them at the same time and I don't need to, to be switching desktops. Um, let me see, there's someone else waiting, so let me admit. For you that joined right now, the um, the workshop is being recorded and you have access to the recording afterwards. So, okay, I was saying, I'm gonna present you this project where I tested the migrator in an unconventional way. 
And what I mean is that I'm going to present you the evolution of these tests. Well, actually, let's run the tests first. I think it's going to be nice if you see what's going on before you start looking into the code. So I have Cypress, the app, uh, open here in my screen. And I'm going to run the tests in on Electron just because then I don't get confused with uh, another Chrome open. Uh, I'm going to click in the migrator.cypress.sci.js, which will basically run the tests in what is called interactive mode. So what the tests do is they access the page migrator.cypress.io, where we have the, in the left side where we can type the protractor commands, and then I click the migrate button and I check that the correct thing was migrated in the right side. And I also do some other checks that you see in a while. So uh, we have 31 tests, so we are almost there. I think it's important that you see the tests running before we go and look into the code. Um, so as soon as it finishes, we can uh, use time travel functionality of Cypress. Uh, by the way, if you are not very familiar with Cypress, uh, Cypress is a test framework that allows you to test anything that runs in the browser. And it gives you a very good development experience. It allows you to write tests in a very productive way. And it gives you all the tools that you need to be productive and to debug your tests when they are failing. Um, different than other tools uh, like Selenium based, for instance, where you would run your tests. And even if you are running them, them in headed mode where you can see the browser, right? When the tests finish, what happens usually with these old tools is that the browser closes and you don't have any more evidences other than uh, stack uh, trace on your command line. Uh, so one of the nice things on Cypress is that after the tests are finished, the browser is kept open and you can see how the application is when the tests ended. But not only that, as you can also navigate back to uh, each of the tests. So for instance, in this one here, we are migrating protractors submit command into Cypress submit command. And then we can use the time travel functionality to see how was the application when I executed the visit command to slash, which is basically the home page. And this is how the application was rendered at that time. Then we can see that I got uh, some text areas. Two of them were returned, and I gave to them an alias called text areas. Then I got the first one, and I pressed select all. Uh, then we can see the before and after, uh, where we can see here that it selected the, the content. Then I typed clear and then it was all clear. So I start in a fresh state with everything clear. And then I can finally get the left side up. Oh, and then I give it, I give to this, um, to this first text area as uh, an, an alias called left side editor, okay? And then I get the left side editor and I type something. Here you can see the before and after. So this is how it looked before. And after I typed, I typed element by CSS form dot submit, right? And then I find the button that contains the text migrate to Cypress. I click on it before and after. And then afterwards, after I clicked, I can see here that it transformed this command here into a Cypress command. And I can also see that it directed me here, it pointed me here to the commands that are being used here. So in here, I'm using sci.get and .submit. So it shows me links to the official doc Cypress documentation, both for the cypress.get and for the .submit command. Uh, and these are things that we are testing. Uh, as you can see, when I clicked the button, um, Oh, now it kind of got lost. But when I click the button, I had to, the, 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 the viewport was in the button itself. So I had to scroll back 
I had to go to the text areas, get the last one, which is now the one in the right side, scroll it into the view to run my assertions that it expected to see a site.get form dot submit and to, uh, no, it expected this text here, site.get form submit to include site.get form dot submit. Basically, I'm asserting that it's showing what it should be shown. And then afterwards, I come to this section here where we have the Cypress commands that were used and I iterate through, uh, through them. First, I just check that um, it contains site.get. Then I find the first, uh, I find the anchors. It returned two elements. I find the one with the um, index zero and I check that it has the correct href attribute, which is on.cypress.io slash get pointing to the correct, um, to the correct uh, documentation. And then I do the same for the second one where I get them all. Um, I check that there is the submit here. I find both A's. Now I go to the one with the index of one, which is the site of submit, and I run another expectation that it has the correct um, URL, the correct href value for that specific uh, anchor tag. Okay. Uh, so, and all the tests, they do exactly the same thing. So they visit the page. So for instance, in this here, we are seeing that we can migrate <clears throat> from dot submit to dot submit. In this case, it's just the same, but instead of element by CSS, we get sci.get. In other uh, ones, for instance, here, we are migrating the send keys into dot type. So if we go here, for instance, uh, let's see uh, this one here. You can see that I typed element by CSS, my selector dot send keys ABC. And what I have in the right is side dot get selector dot type ABC, which I find dot type a lot more clear than send keys. Uh, this is something that I find really nice on Cypress. Like there, the, it's API is it's very easy to read and easy to follow. Um, okay. So this is what the test does. All the tests, they visit the page, clean the text area in the left side, type a protractor command, click the migrate, and check that the migrated snippet in the right is correct, and that here below we have both the, the we have the commands that were used here in the right side. So that side.get and dot type. So here we have side.get and side.type. And we not only check that these values are here, but also that they are pointing to the correct URL uh, in the documentation. So if we go, for instance, uh, here, we migrated element by CSS A to site.get A. We'll see here below that we have site.get A. And if we click on it, we are directed to the dot .get uh, command in this official Cypress documentation, OK? Uh, now to the fun part, hopefully. <laughs> so for this application, we have at the moment 42 commits. And I'm going to start with some of the first commits. So the initial commit was when I created a project on GitHub, and it basically created for me uh, the license file. So that's basically it. When I said that I would present you this, the architecture for these tasks in an unconventional way, it means that I'm going to show you through the history of commits while I was creating the project. Okay. Again, if you have any questions during the workshop, feel free to, uh, to shoot them both on, um, on Discord or here in the channel, in the Zoom chat. And let me see here. Okay, so then I have a commit that creates a Cypress project where I'm basically creating the git ignore file, the readme file, a Cypress example file, cypress.end.example file, the package lock, 
and the package.json where I have already installed Cypress, where in that moment I was using version 10.4. I actually migrated to 11 uh, today, I think, and I've been migrating, uh, upgrading to the latest versions as they, they come, okay? So this is a not very important commit. And for the important commits, I put in the commit message a V and a number. So V1, V2, V3, which is like the versions, let's say, of this uh, task scripts while I was creating them. And the first one is the V1 is lots of duplications. So this is the name of the commit. Uh, I have created some tests with lots of document duplications. And here I have then configured Cypress. When you install Cypress and you open it for the first time, it will bootstrap itself. It will create the cypress.config file. It will create the Cypress directory with the end to end. Um, you can even tell it to create some tests for you. Uh, it will create the support director, uh, the directory with the end to end.js file. And, and then I started configuring my project where I told Cypress that I, in the first place, I would not use fixtures. You saw that in the final version, I am using fixtures. But when I started, I said, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna use fixtures. So I'm gonna configure Cypress saying fixture folder, false. I'm not gonna use it for the moment. And then I created this migrator.sci.js file, um, where in here I have created a task suite called Cypress migrator. So when you create a test suite, you call the describe function, which receives two arguments. The first one is the title of your test suite. And the second argument is a callback function. Inside the callback function is where you, the body, inside of the body of the callback function is where you add your tests. And your tests follow the same syntax. But instead of describe, they are it blocks. The first argument of your it block is the title of your test and the second argument is a callback function. And inside the body of this callback function is where you have the details, the implementation details for that specific test. So the first test is it migrates protractors browser.get. So I run a site.visit to migrator.cypress.io. Then I do a site.get to the text areas that are inside an element that has both the classes side by side and .vs. So let me actually um, do one thing here uh, so you can you can understand what, what's going on. Uh, this is a text area uh, and this as well. But this one in the line in the right uh, is read only, and this one is not because this is where we type things to migrate to the other side. Um, let me see. It seems that there's someone else. Uh, let's admit this one person. Um, so if I inspect, what's going on? Let's inspect, and let's inspect. Uh, this one here, we have editor wrapper, and we have a section, and we have a div, and we have another div. Let's see, where is it? Okay. Then we have these two divs here, right? And we have another div. Let's see, how is it? Another one. Another one. Oh my gosh, it's so much stuff here. Well, I it's gonna be difficult to find it seems. Uh, but somewhere <laughs> there is a text area. Let me see if I can maybe try to find the text area from the bottom up. It's quite difficult to find it. Well, well, anyway. Um, what happens is inside there, there is the text area. Uh, this class side by side is because both these elements are, as you can see, side by side, right? Uh, there's one in the left side and one in the right side. And both of them also have the dot, the, the VS class. So dot in front is just to say that this is a class. So I'm basically 
using sci.get to get all the text areas that are inside an element we have, which has both the side by side and dot vs and the vs classes. Then I, uh, well, I was here actually. I'm sorry. So I get the text areas and I say go to the first one and clear because you remember that when I access it for the first time, it already has some text there. So I want to clear it. And then there is something weird, which I which is I'm clear clearing it again. And that's fine. It's the first version. I'm not going to worry about it. The thing is that when I was testing it, sometimes I would type, I would uh, clear the thing and it would still miss some lines. Like it would clear it like this. So I would clear it again, just in case to be sure that everything was correct. Is this uh, the right way to do it? Surely not. But as I said, I'm okay with that because this is just the first version. Ideally, what we should be doing is wait for the application to be in the state we want it to be so we can start interacting with it. Since it was the first version, I just left it this way, clear it twice. With that second clear, I'm pretty sure that everything was cleared. And then I typed browser.get and my uh, personal website, palmier.dev. Then I use site.contains to get a button that contains the text migrate to Cypress and I click on it. So I'm coming here, clearing this thing, typing something, finding the button, clicking the button, right? And then I get again the text errors, but now instead of the first, I'm getting the last, which means the one in the right side. And then I scroll it into the view because when I click the button, it was a, there was a scroll to the, to, to the button itself. So I had to scroll into the view to go back to, to, to have the text area back in my view so I could run some assertions on it. And then I chain a dot should where the dot should basically gets as attribute, the dot should, re, the, the should receives as, in this case, it's receiving as an argument a function an arrow function, and this arrow function is receiving as an argument the text area itself, the one in the right, which is the last, okay? And then I expect that the index zero of this text, the value of the index zero of this text area includes site.visit, HTTPS, column, slash, slash, walmir.dev. So I typed browser.get and I got site.visit instead. Okay, uh, and then I did the same thing for other commands. So now I'm migrating protractors element by CSS. I visit, I clear twice, I type, I click in the migrate, I go to the last one, to the last text area, I scroll into the view, and now I check that element by CSS selector is the, the equivalent in the Cypress world would be side.get selector. And then I do the same for protractors element by class name, where in here protractor has a specific um, command to get elements by their class name, which is element by class name, sample class, for instance. And in the Cypress world, it's just another side.get with the syntax for class, which is a dot in front of the value. Uh, then protractor also have a command called CSS containing text. So I can identify an element by its CSS and the, the text content, right? So I, here I type element by CSS containing text selector and the, the text that I want this element to have. I click the button and I check that it is transformed into site.get selector dot contains sample content. This is how it was when I tested the application for the first time. You see that if we copy this specific thing here and we type it here and we tell migrate, nowadays it's just a site out contains with two arguments, the selector as the first one and the text as the second. This was a suggestion of mine. When I was experimenting, I felt it weird that it would migrate to 
Sci.get dot contains when it could use just Sci.get contains passing two arguments. So I suggested that, and the Cypress team decided that that was a good idea. So nowadays, this is not what this migrates to anymore. Instead, it migrates to just Sci.get contains with the selector and the text that we wanted to contain. Uh, I will pause for a moment and I will ask you for some feedback. Uh, how are you feeling? Uh, are you enjoying it so far? Is there any question, anything that you want me to clarify before I move on? Feel free to uh, to shoot your uh, questions or feedback both in the chat here on Zoom or on Discord as well in the workshop uh, under the DASJS um, workshops channel. Okay, so I already got some feedback here that it's very interesting and it's nice. So thanks uh, to both of you that gave me this feedback. Uh, if I can make it uh, nice for one person, I'm already happy. If I can make it nice for all of you, even better. Uh, so someone else here said that's good as well. All right. So this is the first version and the commit was has lots of duplications. And as you can see, I am duplicating a lot here. Like I have one, two, three, four, five tests, and they are basically doing all the same, visiting the page, typing the command that I want to migrate, clicking the button and checking that it was migrated correctly. So there is a lot of duplication. So let's see how version two is. On version two, I said move duplicated code to before each hook. So Cypress uses Mocha behind the scenes. And Mocha is a test uh, library for unit testing. Um, and it gives you some very handful, uh, very helpful uh, commands like before each, where you can remove some duplicated code for things that every test should start in that same state. So as you might have imagined every test needs to visit the page, clear the field before it starts. So I moved all that duplicated code to a before each hook. So now right after the describe, instead of having the test, we first have a before each function, which receives as an argument, an arrow function. It could be a normal function. It doesn't necessarily need to be an arrow function. I like arrow functions because they are shorter. And then I put here the site.visit, uh, the get of the text areas, where now I am not only getting the text areas, but I'm also using the dot s and passing a string text areas to give an alias to this thing here. So I don't have to duplicate this selector anymore because now I have an alias. This is something that I uh, not, not, not many people that use Cypress know that you can give alias to elements. So you don't need to duplicate the selectors. And then people start, th start you know, putting selectors in variables or in other files and things like that because you don't want to duplicate the selectors. You not, don't necessarily need to do that if you know how to use Cypress API and, for instance, give alias to elements. You don't need to duplicate this anymore because now you have an alias here, which I'm using right here. Then I get the first text area. I clear it twice. It's OK for now. Uh, then I um, then I give it to the first one, I give an alias of left side editor. So I gave an alias to both the text areas and also to the one in the left. Then now that I have an alias for the text areas for both of them, I can use the alias again here instead of duplicating this selector here, which is a little, a little bit more complex than just at text areas, and I get the last one, which is the one in the right. And since it's the one in the right, I give to it an alias of right side editor because I'm going to use it afterwards. And then the tests start, where now I don't need to do all these duplications in the test. In the test, I am migrating protractors browser.get. So I basically get the left side editor and I type what I want. I click the migrator, uh, the migrate button. And I get the right side editor, I scroll it into the view and I run my assertion. As you can see here, I have removed 
lots of lines and I added just one line here. I have removed two and I added just one. And here it could be one and one because I just broke the, the line. It could be all in the same line. But as you can see, the code is shorter. This commit, I deleted 32 uh, lines and I added only 19. So I made my test suite a little bit shorter and I don't have that much duplications anymore. But this is just version two, okay? So on version three, I decided that I would create a custom command to the migrate action. Looking into it today, I don't think I would do it because I basically am creating, instead of doing site out contains button that contains the text migrate to Cypress and clicking on it, I created a custom command called migrate, site out migrate, which does this thing for me. But as I was saying before, this dot click could, without any problem, be just on line 19. And I would still just have one line. It would be pretty clear what it's it, what it does. It gets a button that contains that text and clicks on it. Uh, but for the sake of uh, doing this on-demand refactor, the refactoring that I mentioned uh, earlier, I decided that I would have some custom commands. So I created the migrate custom command. And now instead of doing this here, I just say site.migrate, site.migrate for all the tests. And in the test file itself is where I created the custom command. I was just playing around, experimenting with things. I didn't know if this would be the way to go. So instead of putting the, the custom commands in my support file, I just put them directly in here and I use them directly because they are not used in other files. There's no other test file anyway. So I put them directly in here. And this is the definition of the custom command. So I am using the Cypress module, from it the commands module, from it the add function, where I'm adding a migrate command. And the migrate command executes this function here, which basically runs site.contains button, migrate to cypress.click. And the test is a little bit shorter. Uh, every test is one line shorter. It, it, as I said, it could be just the same if the click was in the same line. But in the end, I have deleted 10 lines and I added 10 lines because although here I removed two and added one, in here I had to add the custom command, which added a few more lines. So it's, it's even, okay? And this is version three. Since I created a custom command for migrating, I decided why not to create also for the assertion? I'm not a big fan of creating custom commands for assertions. Uh, I do prefer to have the assertions in the test file with the details that they should have. But in this specific case, the assertion was a bit too complex. And then I decided that it would be uh, maybe worth to extract it to a uh, custom command. So the name of the so I basically replace this in all the tests, as you can see, to side out assert right side editor code snippet, and I pass to it the code snippet that I wanted to have in the right side. Okay, and I put the definition of the custom command directly in the test file as I had done. I have done with the migrate command. So I have like cypress.commands.add, the name of my custom command, and the function that it executes, where in this case, it receives as argument a snippet, and it does the site.get to the right side editor, scroll it into view, in chain a should that receives uh, a function that receives as argument the text area itself and expect the value of the text area to include the snippet that we are passing to it as an argument in here. Okay, this one removed 27 lines of code and added only 13. So my test suite is getting shorter, more to the point, okay? Then I have noticed that I was using some alias that was not necessary anymore. So notice that uh, until before, we have just the title of the commit. For V, until before, we had just the title of the commit. For v5, the, I decided not to not to have just a title for the commit, but also a description. And this is something that I find very uh, valuable, especially when I'm reviewing code from others. 
that if the title is not specific enough, I can add more information in the description of my commits. So the title of my commit is remove unnecessary element alias. And then I gave some more context. Instead, call it directly where it's used now that it's used only once. So let's see the code. And in here, in my, if we uh, expand this, in my before each hook, I was giving an alias to both the text areas as te er, test, text areas. I was giving an alias to the first one as left side editor. And I was getting the text areas dot last and giving it an alias to the one to the last, which is the one in the right to of right side editor. But after I have done this refactoring and I removed all the duplication and I moved things to the before each, I wasn't actually using this alias more than once. So I like to add this kind of abstractions when I'm using at least this, the thing three times or at uh, minimum two, but I prefer when it's like I repeated this three times, then it's time to move it to, to, to an alias, for instance. But after I did, I did this refactoring, I was using it only once. And so I felt that it was more complexity to add this alias here than just do something like that. Side out, get the text errors dot last, which is the is is the one in the right side. So this is a very short commit, uh, and uh, the point here is that we don't need to add abstractions when there is no need because the abstraction that we is we created is just only is just being used in one specific place. So there's no real real need for the abstraction, uh, which in this case would be just this alias here. Um, and I also mentioned about the uh, that you can always give more context to help people review your code, not only giving a title, but also a description for the commit itself. Here we are on version five. So let's go to the newer, newer commits where we can move on to version six, where I added a type on left side custom commit. Again, if I was to do it today, I would probably not create the, this custom command, but I already had a, com a custom command for clicking the migrate, migrate. I had a custom command for uh, the assertion, so why not create a custom command for the action itself? So action uh, the, for, the, for typing in the right side editor. Um, oh, that's nice. We have already 28 participants. I hope you are enjoying. Uh, the workshop. If you have just joined, don't worry. The workshop is being recorded and it will be available to you all uh, in a few days. Okay. So I was saying here now, instead of doing side.get left side editor dot type browser dot get or dot type by element by CSS or element by CSS by class name, now I have a custom command side dot type on left side editor and here is the text that I want to type into the left side editor. And then I have the definition of my custom command right below here, uh, uh, just above the migrate command. So cypress.commands.add, the name of my command, which is exactly the name you see here, type on left side editor and the function that will be executed, which receives the snippet. It gets the left side editor by its alias and then types on it the snippet that was received here, which for this test here, the snippet was element by CSS selector dot send keys. For this one was element by CSS containing text selector, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And now we can see that the test file itself, it was pretty, the, the, the tests themselves, they were pretty straightforward. Like in the before each, we have all the parts that is not being duplicated anymore. And the tests, if we look here, it starts on line 12 and it ends on line 18, the first test. It has one, two, three lines. It types on the left side, it migrates, which is basically clicking the button and it runs the assertion. Same for the, for, for the, the second one, types, migrate, assert. Type, migrate, assert. So I am making my test suite shorter and more 
to the point, okay? Then we have version seven, where now I decided that it was time to move the custom commands to the right place. So if you don't know, Cypress, when it starts, it, when it bootstraps itself, it creates a support directory where you can add your custom commands. So Cypress has its own commands like site.visit, site.get, dot type, dot click, site of request, site of intercept, lots of commands. You can look to all of them at docs.cypress.io. Um, but you can create your own. As I was doing until now, and I was putting the definition of these custom commands in the test file itself. But Cypress has this support directory where you can put this custom commands there, and it will, they, they will still be available for you in the global site object. So in this commit of version seven, I basically cut all these custom commands that were defined in the migrator.site.js file, and I put them into the commands file, which is inside of the support folder inside of the Cypress folder. So I basically put them there, cut from one place, paste it in the other, and then in the end-to-end.js file inside of the support file, I'm importing the commands, basically. So the commands are available in my test. And then my test file now has only 50 lines of code. And it's pretty straightforward, as you can see here now. Each test has only three lines inside. Uh, if we exclude the empty lines that I prefer to leave just for giving it some breath and you can read it uh, easier. Uh, but the tests there are pretty straightforward. And when they end, it's, it's done. We have five test cases for this test suite, and they do basically the same. They type, they migrate, and they assert, okay? But they type different things, and so they assert different things. Um, and the before each here has uh, all the steps that all the tests need, so we don't need to repeat them all around. So this is version seven. Um, and then we have version eight, where I, I said shorten spec file. And here we can see that I also have a little bit more details in the description of the commit. So by iterating over an array of test scenarios based on a fixture file. This commit here is one of the most important of this project because this is uh, the commit that made this test suite to become what it is today, okay? So pay attention to this one. Remember that when I configured Cypress in the first place, I said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to use fixtures. So I was I configured Cypress with fixtures folder files. Now I have removed in, in red here, we have the lines that were removed and in green, the lines that were added. So I have removed this here because I decided, you know what? Now I'm, I think I'm going to use fixtures and I'm going to use fixtures to shorten this back file as my commit message says. Um, in my test file, so I created some fixtures. So I created in, uh, the fixtures directory and inside the fixtures directory, I created the test scenarios.js file, uh, which you see in a while. Uh, and I'm basically importing the test scenarios from this fixture file, okay, in the test. And now I have still my describe, I still have my before each with all the repetitive code, but I have deleted all those tests. And instead of having all those tests, which there was still a lot of duplication, right? I was doing this and this and this, and the only thing that was changed, changing was actually the arguments of the first and this, the, the last custom commands. So instead I said, you know what? I could have an array, which would have every, uh, um, this array would have different objects and these objects would be my test cases. So I decided that if I had that, I would be able to do test scenarios, which is the variable that I defined in here from my fixtures. And I am using the for each iterator from the array to iterate over each scenario, okay? And then I'm getting the scenario, which is an object, from this object, I'm destructuring the title, the snippet to be migrated and demigrated snippet. And then I create my it block. 
and the it block will have the title as the description of my test. And it will run a side dot type on left side where, where it will be, will type the snippet to be migrated, which was this structure here from the scenario. It will side dot migrate to click the button and it will run my assertion, uh, receiving as argument the migrated snippet, which was the structure in here. And now it's the fixture file. It basically looks like this. So I am basically exporting a variable, a const variable, um, which is an array, okay? Oops, so the array starts here and it starts here and ends here, right? This array has five objects inside, five elements inside, and these elements are basically JavaScript objects. So the first object has title, snippet to be migrated, migrated snippet. Second, the same. The third, the same. The only thing that changes is the title. The value of the properties is what changes. So the first test will be migrates protractor browser.get. Second one, migrates protractor element by CSS. In the first one, the snippet to be migrated will be browser.get. While in the second, it will be element by CSS. The migrated snippet in this case will be site.visit. While in the second is site.get and so on and so forth. But the idea is now that I have done that, I can add as many scenarios as I want, and I don't have to change one line of code in the task file. I just add another, I just add a comma, another object with title a snippet to be migrated and migrated snippet. And when I run my tasks, I have one more test case. And if I add more, I will have more test cases. And that's as easy as it would be. So before I think my, our test file had around 50 lines, now it only has 21 lines and it's very to the point. It's basically this thing here, right? right. We are iterating over each test scenario. We are creating it blocks for each of them. And for all of them, we are doing the same thing, but we are passing different arguments, okay? Um, now we are in version eight, so let's go to version nine. Uh, there are 42 commits. Not all of them have versions. I'm gonna go until version 21, which is the last one that has significant change. And then we can briefly look into what I added later, but it's basically upgrading Cypress and doing some other things. Maybe we can look into the GitHub action workflow that I have created as well. Um, so, I was, until now, until version eight, I was using custom commands. And then on version nine, I decided to not use them anymore. And there is a description for that. And I said, do not use custom commands since they were used only once. They are not needed anymore. So again, I said that before for the alias. If you are creating an alias and you, you are using it only once, there is no need for an alias. The same applies for a custom command. If you are creating custom commands, you are adding another layer of abstraction to your task suite. You're moving these commands to the support file. And then you notice that, you know what, now that I have migrated everything, uh, I'm using it only once because now there is only one it block which uh, is executed based on how many fixtures, how many, how many uh, uh, test scenarios I have in my fixture file, right? So I, instead of having these abstractions of type on left side editor, side out migrate and side out assert, I prefer to have the implementation details in the test file itself, because if I want to understand what's going on, I don't need to go to another file. Everything is in here and there's no duplications, right? I'm not duplicating anything. There's like, I, I created the, a smart way to create many test cases using the exact same structure based on fixtures, okay? So I basically removed the commands completely. I removed the import from the support end-to-end uh, -end file. And I'm inside the, it, I have the get left side editor and type the, snip, the snippet to migrate, to be migrated. I get the button that contains the migrate to Cypress and I click on it. And I get all the text errors, go to the last one, which is the one in the right side, this one here, and I checked. 
check that it has the correct value, that the migrated snippet is there. All right. Uh, let's go to version 10. Let me see here if we have any questions. There is some mention from Duke. Nice design with fixtures direct directory. Easy to add us later. Yeah. And you see that uh, in a few uh, commits, I'm just basically adding more tasks. And it's as easy as adding more entries to that file. So on version 10, I updated tests with an extra assertion. So, so far, I was just testing that if I type something here and I click, I'll get something else here. But I wasn't testing this part here below. So this is what I started testing on version 10. So I decided that besides the title, the snippet to be migrated and the migrated snippet, I would also add a Cypress command to my fixture object, uh, to each of my fixtures uh, in the array. And then besides running this assertion here that the last, the last text area would have the content that it should have, I'm also getting the API details element and I am asserting that it should contain the Cypress command, uh, which in the fixtures, basically, besides the snippet to migrate, I added Cypress command, site.visit, Cypress command, site.get, Cypress command, site.get, Cypress command, site.contains, Cypress command, dot type. Because when I migrate, I see here a list of uh, the commands, right? And in here, for instance, there is just one command. But if I was, for instance, doing a dot click on it, click, and I migrate, I would have actually here site.contains selector sample content dot click. And in here, I would have two, uh, actually two um, commands. In version 10, I'm just checking the first one. Okay, so I'm not passing more than one. I'm just checking that it has the one that I want to, that, that I think it's more, the most important. Uh, afterwards, you see that there is a commit that introduced a way to check them all, okay? Um, so that's version 10. Yeah. Um, let's see. Then on version, uh, so this is no version, so I'm gonna skip it. Remove duplication from fixture file. As you could see in the fixture file was saying migrate protractors and then the command. So it was migrate protractor, um, Let's see, it was migrate protractors browser.get, migrate protractors element by CSS. So the migrate protractors was always repeated. In this case, I decided, you know what? I could simply uh, use template literals. So in here, I pass just what changes, which is the command itself, send keys uh, by CSS containing text, by class name. But the other part doesn't change. And so in here, I for my it block, I use template literals where I interpolate the string migrates protractors and then the variable, which is the title that I am receiving. And then this way, I am not reducing the number of lines. I'm just uh, leaving my fixture uh, value property a little bit shorter and without duplications in that sense. So this is a pretty straightforward commit, version 11. Um, version 12, I decided to better name an object attribute. So I had snippet to be migrated, and then I changed it to snippet, snippet to migrate. So just left it a little bit shorter, shorter, but still with a very meaningful name that you look into it and you understand what it is. It's the snippet to migrate, basically. So I like to follow the, 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 the Boy Scout rule of leaving the campground a little bit cleaner than you found it. So I was, you know, reviewing my own code and looking into it. And I thought, you know what, this could be instead of snippet to be migrated, just snippet to migrate would be shorter. It would be concise. It would still be very clear what it is. So I just changed that. And then um, I changed it when I am destructuring all the info from the scenario, when I am iterating over my scenarios, 
and then I changed in the fixtures uh, the name of the property as well accordingly, okay? So this is version 12. Uh, let's see, I think uh, we have some comments here in the chat. Don't moving test cases to fix your files make the tests harder to understand. Olga, I don't think so. Uh, in my opinion, it's actually because all the implementation of the test is uh, in the test file. What the test does is very clear in the test file, right? So let's go to version eight here, uh, which is this one. This is what, the, or actually, yeah. No, let's go to do not use custom commands, this one. This is what the test does. It gets a title and then it's, it runs side.get, left side editor, and it types the snippet to be migrated. It clicks the button and it runs the assertion. So it's very to the point what the test does. The idea of migrating, uh, uh, what I did to the fixtures is that I had lots of duplications still in my test code that were not necessary if I were using this uh, for each function that I am using now. Uh, so I would say that uh, in my opinion, no, it's actually, it's making things even uh, easier to understand because I don't need to go to, to different, I, when I need to add a, a different test scenario, it's just an, adding an, another entry in my um, in my feature. Actually, the inspiration for doing this this way is uh, a tool called Backstop JS. Uh, Backstop JS. It's a, a tool for visual regression testing, which I uh, I have uh, teached about it. I have course about it both in Portuguese and English on my Udemy uh, profile, and with backstop JS, you basically do something very similar. Like there is just a JSON file um, where you define your scenarios as objects inside of an array, and they have the same prop. They could have the same properties. And then you, you, when you want to add another scenario, you just add another entry in in your JSON file. In this case here, in our case, a JavaScript file. Um, but this, uh, just to give you some context, was the, the inspiration, let's say, for doing it this way. Okay, so I let's see in which one we were. Um, okay, so we were in better name object attribute V12. So V13, clear twice only when needed. So I did some improvement. Uh, remember that in the beginning, we were uh, getting the first uh, element and then typing uh, using the dot clear command from Cypress and then clearing it again, which was super weird, but it was needed because sometimes the application here wouldn't be in the correct state. And when I would clear, it would still leave something that, so I would have to clear it again. Okay. Uh, but then I said, you know what? Uh, this is still not ideal, but it's a little bit better, I think. So I'm gonna, uh, get the text areas. From the text areas, I'm going to get the first, which is the one in the left side, which is the one that is not read only. Before clearing, I'm going to type between brackets, select all to basically do something like this. I would be selecting all the text and then I would do dot clear to clear it all. So I would then clear, okay? And then I would chain a dot then which can receive as an argument a function. This function can, can receive as an argument the subject, the, ele the subject element itself, which in this case is the first text area. So this is why I'm calling the variable text area. And then I'm saying, I'm adding a condition. If there is still some value for this specific text area, then log in the Cypress command logs that you're clearing again, wrap this text area and then execute the dot clear command again. But when I added this select all and clear, it solved 98, 99% of the cases. In some cases, it was still leaving something there and then it was reaching this if condition, it was returning true and it was clearing again. So there were two different solutions for the thing. One was selecting all before clearing and then 
if there is still some value, which is like text area of index zero, zero dot value dot length, if there is still some value there, then log that you are clearing again and do clear it again. So it's better. It's not clearing if it's not typing dot, it's not executing the dot clear twice if not needed, only if it's really needed. Okay. Um, and I fix the test title, which is not relevant. 14, allow the to test more than one Cypress command. So remember that I said that before I was only testing the first one here. So I want to test them all because if this command here is actually returning not just site.contains but also a dot click, I want to test that both of them are displayed in here. And even inspect here to show you one thing. Um, um, let's see. More details. Is it uh, what I'm using? API details. Yeah. As you can see here, this div has this data test attribute, API details. And inside this div, we have a unordered list, which has two list items. The first one for the site.contains element uh, text and the second one for the site.click. So I'm so the Cypress team, they added what I like to call testability in their front-end application, adding data test attributes that I could use to uh, make assertions uh, in this case, or it could be to uh, run actions as well. Um, so basically here, Let's see, allow to test more than one side, side customer. So before my fixture was receiving a Cypress command, now it's receiving Cypress commands. The fixture itself now, instead of Cypress command receiving a string, it receives an array. And if there's just one command, it's gonna be an array with only one, com one string inside, which in this case is site.visit, in this case is site.get. But if there is more than one command like this one that has a site.get and a site.contains, then it, I can put more. And if there were three, four, as much as, as many uh, commands I needed, I could put them because now Cypress commands is an array, it's not a string anymore. And then in the test file, I am, after I run the assertion, after I run the assertion that the correct snippet was migrated correctly, I also iterate over the Cypress commands. And then in the Cypress commands, I run for each and I pass a callback function. This callback function receives each of the commands. So in this case, it will receive just site.visit. But in this case, for the first iteration, it will receive site.get. And for the second, it will receive site.contains. Uh, and then I check that the API details should contain the command. So for the first iteration, it would check, does it have site.get? Yeah, it does. Let's go to the second iteration. Does it have the site.contains? Yeah, it does. So it would do it like, look if site.contains is here and if site.click is here, okay? So now I added a um, little bit more uh, assertion to my test. I'm not just checking that one, command is there, but all of them that should be there are there. So this is version 14. Uh, then on version 15, I added a bunch of new tests by just updating the fixture file. That's the beauty of this project here. Now, if I want to add lots of new tests, uh, as I was saying to Olga first, like now you can see that it's pretty easy to add a new test, Olga. You can just add new entries to your fixture with different values for the same attributes, title, snippet, to migrate, migrated snippet, and Cypress command. So if I want to test how this element by ID works, this is how it, it, it looks in uh, protractor uh, syntax, and this is how it would be in Cypress. So instead of element by ID and then your ID in here, you would have site.get hash my ID, right? Uh, 
is displayed instead of have expect element by css selector is displayed to be true you would have site.get selectors should be visible and in this case since i would have site.get and should i would have in the cypress commands site.get and dot should is present expect element by css by css the selector is present to be true it would be transformed into cypress.get selector should exist again as you can see what I said in the beginning, most, if not all the Cypress commands, they are shorter than the protractor ones. This one is shorter than this one. This one is shorter than this one. And the same goes on and on and on. Even browser.get title is just site.title, right? Um, and, and they are still very easy to understand, actually, in my opinion, a lot easier to understand than what we have with Protractor. I'm not going to through all of the scenarios. It's just all the same, just passing different values for the title, for the snippet to migrate, uh, for the migrated snippet, and for the commands, uh, where somewhere we might have here, for instance, I am, I am migrating expect element by CSS, all the LEs, LIs inside of the unordered list, and, the, and getting the count of them and expecting that they should be three. Uh, in Cypress, it would be site.get, ul, li. Its length should dip equal to three. In this case, it's a little bit longer than the one above, but still very easy to understand, very easy to read. Get all the allies inside the unordered list, get its length, and it should be dip equal to three. Okay, and then because I have site.get, I have its, I have, I have should in the Cypress commands array, I can have site.get, its, and should in here. Okay, and I don't have to, to change anything in the test code itself, just in the fixtures, and I have lots more, a lot of more tests now. Uh, let me see here. We have a few more uh, main, um, messages in the chat. Um, there is one, I agree with Olga, the first way seemed easier to understand. Uh, well, I hope uh, by the end of the workshop, uh, you can you can, you can can change your mind. And if you don't want, that's okay as well. I'm not here for you to change your mind. I'm just showing you uh, the process of creating this test suite in the way that I found uh, that would be optimal. Um, here, it probably makes sense since there's only now now test file. I think it should be one test file. Uh, yeah, but but still, uh, Rostislav, still, if there were other test files, the other test files would be testing other things, not the same things. So I still think that it still makes sense, you know, because the other things would have other commands and they wouldn't need anything from this test file because our test they should be independent and we shouldn't be over testing things uh, which is something that i see uh, most people coming from other um from other test frameworks doing over testing the application what i mean by that is doing too much through the ui instead of creating more optimized ways to to do the things uh, and cypress allows you to do things in a more optimized way uh, if you want to learn more about how to optimize your tests, I would encourage you to come here to my website, valmir.dev, and go to the to my courses on Udemy. And then if you go to the intermediate course, you see what I'm talking about. You can create all the preconditions of your tests in a very optimized way, for instance, doing uh, requests, uh, HTTP requests. And then when you go to your test, you reach the application with all the data that you need already there. And then you don't need to do that much through the UI, which in the end means that you wouldn't need to have all these abstractions and everything because you are doing the things through the UI only once anyway. <laughs> Let's see what else we have here. Uh, <clears throat> not the case with my app. I use lots of tests, side.js files, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Duke seems to be more of a style preference. In the past, my teammates stressed that things needed to be as dry as possible. But I find the test scenarios.js file to be very easy to understand. The objects are basically title, tab, task, 
expected result. Yeah, exactly. Um, Let's see, there's a message from Marcus. I think that this method is amazing. I'm not sure if people are aware that in the test runner, these appear as separate tasks. So it's easy, still easy to trace where the bug was found. I will definitely adopting this approach. Can cyber session be used uh, in your before each? In this case here, uh, I don't think uh, it would really be needed because I'm not doing any kind of authentication or anything. Uh, I would have to experiment, Marcus, to, to let you know if uh, if I could save in the session the state of the application with already everything cleared. Uh, that's a good idea, actually. I'll try it out afterwards. Uh, just need to get some get used to it. Objects are okay. I use the same approach frequently. I just don't like lots and lots of small files. Why not, Olga? Small files, are, they are easier to read than big ones where you have to have lots of scrolling. Uh, I actually do prefer uh, smaller files than big files. I actually would recommend you to go to a website called uh, bettercodehub.com. Uh, uh, this is a SaaS that I have used in the past. And they have actually, they it's similar to Sonar Cube, but instead of, uh, so it, 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 it clones your repo, let's say, and it, uh, run, it, it, it looks into uh, code smells and like uh, code patterns and everything to see how, uh, bad, how good or bad is the quality of, of your code. But instead of doing something like, um, like Sonar does, which is give you lots of information. What Better Code Hub does is it actually gives you 10 guidelines for you to follow. Let's see if we can find the guidelines. Uh, I think if we go to docs maybe uh, or not, let's see about guidelines. Yeah, it only mentions here. Uh, it, it gives you 10 guidelines. And one of the guidelines is actually that you have to have short files and, uh, and 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 all that stuff. So I highly recommend you to let's see if I can actually sign in with GitHub to give you an example. And let me sip my water here because I've, I've been talking a lot. Um, so yeah, I have here a few uh, projects that I have integrated with this tool, and it's out of the context, but uh, since uh, Olga mentioned, I wanted to, to talk about it. Let's have one that is five, uh, that has maybe score of 10. Yeah, this one, this one has a score of 10. Um, so let's look into it. How do I look into it? Um, I can go to view results. So uh, the, time, the 10 guidelines are write short units of code, write simple units of code, write code once, so the dry thing, keep unit interfaces small, uh, separate concerns in modules, couple architecture components loosely, keep architecture components balanced, keep your code base small, automate your tasks, and write clean code. The first four, they are about the way you write your code. The next four are about the way you architect your code. And the last two are the, the, uh, about the, the ways you work. Um, and if you click on each of them, you he here have uh, tabs, a tab for reading what the guideline is all about. And this one is the one that tells you small units are easier to understand, reuse, and test. And so it gives you some context and if your uh, project is not uh, 10 um, out of 10 as this one, it would give you some info about uh, what could be improved and things like that. So uh, that's my, my take uh, from August mentioned before. Okay, so we are on version 15. Let's see how we are in terms of time. Um, <clears throat> I think we can go into version 21. And then we can have like five minutes break. So you can grab a water, you know, do whatever you want. And then we come back for Q&A. What do you think? Leave your comments on the chat. Uh, let's go to version 16 because we are almost there. 
Uh, version 16, I added just another bunch of tasks. So I already had a bunch of tasks. You see, like my test file is very short. My scenarios in the fixtures is getting big. It's, it has almost 200 lines, but it's, it's, it's still very to the point. It's just a few more entries into my array. They have title, snippet to migrate, migrated snippet, and the Cypress commands that should be available, okay? So very straightforward, just added a few more tasks. 17, allow run tests against a local environment and document how. So this is where I added a session in the, <clears throat> in the documentation. I don't know if I should have added this as a version, but since now it, you can also, I created this script um sci open local yeah maybe it makes sense and then i basically what i did is it, before i was having the <clears throat> the the url inside of the di the side of visit command uh instead i added the url as a property of my config file in the base url then i can simply visit uh slash so the base url is https column slash slash migrator.cypress.io and then i do site of visit slash which will basically add this slash in the end here right after the dot io and then i can um have this script that runs the cypress local uh, or in headless mode where i can overwrite the base url with dash dash config base url HTTPS column slash slash localhost column 4,200, okay? So in case you come here to the Cypress Migrator official project, you clone it, you install off the dependencies, you start up your local environment, and then you do the same, you clone the project from my repo, you can then run the task that I wrote against Cypress Migrator in your local computer instead of the version that is running in production on migrator.cypress.io. This is what uh, version 17 basically allows you to do. Uh, I decided to show you running version that is in the internet because it's much faster than the one um, that when I run it locally, especially now that I am like live streaming, uh, like streaming and uh, not streaming, but uh, yeah, I'm like sharing my screen, streaming my, my video and everything. So let's go to version 18. In version 18, I decided to improve the tasks descriptions. And in here before in my fixtures, I had the property title, but I had the Cypress commands and I thought, you know what? I could have protector command that could be used in my title. And then instead of having my great protractors title, I would have migrates protractors, protractor command, command. So if it was a side uh, element by CSS, it would be migrates protractors element by CSS command into Cypress. And then the Cypress commands, since they are an array, I would just get the first one. So I would calculate the length of it, subtract one because an array starts on index zero and then say command. So it would be, for instance, uh, protra um, migrates protractors element by CSS command into Cypress sci.get command, something like that. And then I changed in my features, every place where I had title, I instead called it protractor command. And that's basically it all until the end. Okay, version 19, we are almost there. Uh, improve tests readability by using the sci-press plugin that I have created. Let me show you. Um, NPM, this is the one. So if you go to npm.js and you search for sci-press, you find this plugin that I have created, which as the, 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 this, its description says, it simply adds a silly cypress uh, cypress.press command that simulates pressing the keyboard keys. You can npm install it as a dev dependency. Afterwards, you can both, you can or import it or require it in your support file. And then 
here is how you use it correctly and how you should not do it. So the idea is you can, for instance, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm testing Google or DuckDuckGo where I would have a, an input text and instead of clicking the magnifying glass button, I would just type and press enter to run my search. This is how I would do uh, using this plugin. I get an input of type text, I type cypress.io and then I press enter. And the available, um, the available keys are described here. Uh, they are the exact same as in the official Cypress documentation. So here are all the available options. You can see back, press backspace, press del, press down arrow, and so on and so forth. Plus, I have added also, you can uh, say press control A. Uh, uppercase or lowercase, and the same for comment if you are a Mac user, for instance. Um, here are examples that use this uh, library. I have actually to add this one in here because it does use it as well. And uh, yeah, just wanted to show you because this is what this commit does. So um, this commit, I installed my lib on version 1.0.2. Because I installed it, I added it, I added it to the n2n.js file inside of the support directory. And now instead of uh, doing type brackets select all, I simply say dot press select all, uh, uh, which would do this thing here. It would do something like this, selects everything that is in there so that I can clear afterwards. So just to give, uh, to make it a little bit easier to read. So if you, what, what does it mean type select all uh, between uh, curly braces, right? Uh, it's kind of weird if you don't, if you, if you don't know exactly what this does in Cypress, but if you say dot press select all, you would uh, understand it better. So this, um, this commit again, the boy scout rule, leave the campground cleaner than you found it. I just left it a little bit easier to read the test itself. Let's go to version 20, the one before the last. <clears throat> now I added an extra assertion on the API details section to test that anchors hrefs are correct. So if you remember when I executed all the tests, uh, I was not only checking that the side contains is here and the side click is here, but also that it has the correct href. So if we inspect here, we'll see that, um, let's see, where is it? Yeah, here is the anchor. It has an href to on.cypress.io slash click. And this other one here has to on.cypress.io uh, dot contain slash contains, which redirects us to docs.cypress.io slash API slash commands slash contains. Okay. So in this version 20, I decided, you know what, I'm not testing this specific thing. And I think this is important. So let's add a test for that. Uh, not add a test, add an extra assertion in the same test that we already have for that. Um, so what am I doing here? Now the only change was in the test file itself. So I'm still uh, I, I'm still iterating over all the Cypress commands, which are those arrays inside of my fixture for that. So I have the test scenarios fixture. Each test scenario is an object which has title, uh, which has like a protractor command, a snippet to migrate, migrated snippet, and the Cypress commands. These are the Cypress commands. So I'm iterating over each of them, but now instead of getting just the command, because I want to check that the command is, is, is displayed in the page, uh, I also want to check that the href of that specific anchor is correct. So before I was using uh, my callback function was receiving just one argument, and then I can omit the parentheses. Now that my, uh, arrow function is receiving two arguments, the command and the index, I have to put the parentheses in place. And I'm getting the index because I will need the index, right? Um, so first I'm running a transformation here where I'm getting 
the command of that specific index. So in the first iteration will be the command in the index zero, which is the first command. In the second iteration, the command in the index one, which is the second command and so on and so forth. I'm basically getting this command and I'm replacing. So the command is, let me open in here. Uh, so the command is something like this, right? Uh, Sci.get or dot submit. Okay, this is a command. This is another command. In some cases, there is the side in front, and some are there, they, they are not. Okay. So I'm basically saying if you find a side, replace it for an empty string. If you find a dot, replace it for an empty string. And if you find a parenthesis, replace it with an empty string. In the end, if we replace this, the dot and the parentheses will get just get. In this one, if we replace the dot and the parentheses, we'll get just submit. And this is exactly what I need because the command itself is sci.contains, sci.click, but the href is just contains or just click. And this is what I need. And this is why I'm doing this transformation, okay? So I'm basically transforming the command to have just the command itself without the side, without the dot, and without the parentheses. Then I get the API details div. I still assert that it should contain my command, which in this case, it's not the transformed version, it's the side.get, uh, open and close parentheses. But from this element, I find the anchor. So I find the A. I, then I will find if there are more than one, for instance, like this, it will say, okay, I found two. Which one you do you want? Get the one with the index that I am on, which if I am in the first iteration, it will get the one with index zero. If I am in the second, the one with index one. If I, want, if I am in the third iteration, it will get the one with index two, and so on and so forth. And then assert that it should have the href uh, it should have the attribute href with the value http column slash slash open on.cypress.io slash my transform command, Cypress command, which is just the contains or get or visit without the side dot and the parentheses at the end. Uh, so with this one, I added this missing verification that I needed to make sure that the application works as it should. Um, and then we have version 21, where I basically shorten uh, a test code, the test code and the variable name a little bit. Um, so in many places, I was doing like uh, breaking the line, side.get left side uh, editor dot type in the next line. And I felt, you know what? It would still be short if it was just in one line and it would make uh, my code uh, a little bit shorter as well, because now instead of two lines, I have one. Uh, same for the click. So I decided to do that. So have the click just after here and the type just after here in the same line. It's still very easy to read, easy to follow. I like to break it down in many when I'm doing something like that, where I'm chaining more than one command. But if I'm chaining just one and the first command is still short, it's maybe better just to have it all in line. And I also changed, I shortened a little bit the name of my variable here to instead of transformed Cypress CMD from command, transformed Cy CMD. So uh, I'm not reducing number of lines here, just making my variable name a little bit shorter, still easy to follow, easy to read. And that's version 21. I, as I said, I would, uh, I think we could have like a small break of five minutes. I'm just gonna stop share, sharing for a little bit. I'm gonna uh, mute my, 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 my mic and mute my camera. Let's go have some water, uh, uh, some like five minutes rest time and we'll be back in five minutes. All right, see you soon. So uh, hope you had uh, some um, sometimes you grab a water, a soda, or, you know, just to hydrate yourself a little bit or to stretch a little bit. Um, we have a question here from Olga. 
where she said, you actually, well, well she said, why using index if you can use sci.contains? And I think you were mentioning about what is in my screen at the moment where I am uh, iterating over the Cypress commands and getting not only the command, but also the index. Uh, and actually I do need the index, uh, Olga, because I'm not asserting on the content of the HTML tag. And instead I've, I'm running an assertion on a specific attribute of that element, which is the href attribute. And so I need to get the div with the data test API details. And then from there, I have to find the anchor element. So this is a div. Inside this div, there's lots of elements. Some of them are anchor tags, which are links, basically. Then I have to say, and then when I find the links, I, I might find, as I showed you here, more than one. So I need to know which one do I want to check for the href attribute? Is it the first? Is it the last? You know? So I do have to say, find the A that has the, e the index equal to zero or one. And then I will say, now I'm looking into this one. See if the href is correct. Second iteration, see if the href of the second one is correct. So uh, that side.contains wouldn't work. Side.contains is just for the content of the tag, not for the attributes of the, uh, the HTML element, okay? Um, and then Olga said something else. So you said here, I can't understand why there could be several anchors. It's exactly what I said before. Let's, let, let's do it this way. So I have this selector here, right? Let's come here. Let's go to the console. It's the document.query selector. And let's pass this in here. So I get this element here, okay? So if, I, if I enter, I get this div, okay? If instead of that, I say, inside of this div, get the A, uh, it will get just the first one. But side.get actually works like query selector all, where if there is more than one element, uh, query, so let's see what did I did wrong. Query selector all. And now it's returned an array where the first item of the array is the first A, and the second item of the array is the second A. So it does return an array of elements. And because it does return an array of elements, I need to use the index to know from which element I want to check for the href. I hope that makes it clear for you to understand all it. Um, let's see, we have a question or a comment. Let's see, a question from Fernanda. Hi, Vomir, thanks for the workshop question. Will the workshop recording be shared afterwards? Yes, it's going to be available, as Sasha just mentioned in the chat uh, in the in the Git Nation portal uh, in a few days. Okay, so yeah, if you arrived uh, late and you weren't able to get uh, all the content, you have con uh, you have access to all of it afterwards. So don't worry. Um, Let's see, there is someone that just arrived. So uh, welcome to someone that just arrived. Uh, hope you, you have a good time. We are kind of uh, uh, more close to the end, but uh, still, as I just said, it's being recorded. It's gonna be available afterwards, so don't worry. So before, after version 21, uh, there are no more versions. It's more like I fixed, uh, when I when when I started coding, uh, if I would change, if I would type sci.get selector dot contains sample uh, content, I would get well actually if I would type element by CSS containing text the selector and then the text I would get before a sci.get selector dot contains sample content, but I created an issue. I can actually show you the issue that I have created. So if we go to issues, 
and we go to closed with issues. Uh, it's the only one that was closed. This was open by me, as you can see here. I said, when migrating something like this, so I want to migrate element by CSS containing text. The selector is dot path or a class uh, path, and the content is dog. It generates side of get dot path dot contains dog. And I said, what about migrating it as just a side dot contains that would receive two arguments? The first one, the CSS selector, and the second one, the uh, the text itself. As side dot containing text uh, receives two arguments, side dot contains also can do it. And then um, someone liked the idea and decided to implement this change. So there was a, pool, a PR pull request to change it, and uh, and this is why I uh, when I was I, when the fix came, I tested again. Uh, against the production environment, the tests that that were checking side out get dot contains were failing because now, now there was just side out contains. So I updated them to be just side out contains the selector and the text, and then I updated of course the Cypress commands as well because here I wouldn't have any more the side out get and the side out contains, and instead I would just have the side out contains. So I updated a few tests here. Uh, then I upgraded to version 10.10. .10. Um, um, what, uh, what else? I removed uh, some Cypress config. Then I added a GitHub action workflow, uh, where I basically copied the basic workflow from the documentation. And now if we go here, we see that for every push that I do, there is a GitHub action that runs the tests. And if we click here, we can see the test results uh, in a terminal like on GitHub, where we can see here Cypress Migrator, migrates protractor browser.get command into Cypress side.visit command, migrates protractors browser.get title command into Cypress side.title command, and so on and so forth. So now this is not only, I, I'm not just able to run these tests. Uh, against a, a remote environment or a local environment in my machine, but I can also run the tests against the production environment using GitHub Actions in a continuous integration workflow. Um, what else? Let's see here in the commits. Um, after I added the, 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 the GitHub, GitHub workflow, I decided to add a badge in the readme to show that the tasks are uh, passing. Then I've been upgrading to from Cypress 10. Point, we started with Cypress 10.4, then Cypress 10.10, .10, then Cypress 10.11, and today I upgraded it to Cypress 10.11.0.1. Uh, and I added this takeaway markdown file. So the badge that I was mentioning is here. So now if the tests fail, this will turn into red. Luckily, everything is working. Not luckily, it's because uh, it's actually working, right? Um, so we have this nice badge here. And um, I would love to answer some questions if you have more, um, but uh, I would like to go to this takeaways.markdown file here that I created because I want you to, to, to get out of this workshop with this thing here. So start simple and add or remove co complexity on demand. I review code of a lot of people. I train people into test automation with Cypress, and I did that with other tools as well, with Protractor in the past, with Backstop.js and, and, and other uh, frameworks as well. And I see people, because they were used to do things in one way, for instance, let's use page objects, which is something that I don't recommend in the Cypress world because there are many other options uh, that we could uh, use. And I don't like page objects also because it over tests your UI. You go through the UI to the same place again and again when you should actually be creating more optimized tests as I like to call them. Um, uh, so start simple, as simple as possible. Even if you have to add some duplications in the beginning as you saw on version one of my commit and evolve it on demand, add the complexity 
when it's needed, not beforehand. Don't try to predict the future, okay? And also, when you notice that you added some complexity and that complexity is not needed anymore, like I showed you in one of the commits where I had actually added the complexity of adding an alias for an element because I was reusing that all around. Now that I'm not using it, it anymore, let's remove that complexity. The same thing for the custom commands. I created custom commands because I was repeating the same thing over and over. Then I decided, you know what? I could have those fixtures and I would iterate over each of them and I would just have one test. Why do I need the custom commands if I'm using the custom commands only once? So remove the complexity as well. Add and remove it on demand. Don't worry about duplicated code when you are starting. You can always refactor it later. As you saw that I've been you know, evolving the architecture of my task suite uh, over time while I was building it. Let the code communicate with you. If it's time to create an abstraction, it will scream that to you, you know? Uh, I think that's very true. Uh, and I don't like to try to predict the future. I prefer to look into the code and see what I said in the very beginning. If I am repeating the thing, the, the same thing twice, it may be okay. If I am repeating the thing more than twice, then the code is starting to scream to me, abstract it somewhere else, create a variable where you can reuse the same variable in the different places where it's being repeated. Um, so let the code communicate with you and then uh, the architecture of the code will be guided by the need of the code itself. Let abstractions as close as possible to where they are used. So uh, this is a good example of this is like in the beginning, I was creating custom commands and instead of putting them in the support file, I was putting them directly in the test file because they were just used there anyway. So there was no real need to have this, you know, oh, now I want to understand how this works and I have to go to another file and then come back to the file where I use it. If it's, if it's used just there. The same for you are, for instance, repeating the same selector over and over. And then you might think, oh, I could create file somewhere else that I can import in my test file and then I can use the selector. But if the selector is only used in that specific file, why not create a variable inside the same file? So you don't need to look to another file, to another abstraction to understand uh, what the thing does or what the thing is. Write short commits that tell a story from the moment the code was born until the current moment. So this is exactly what you saw and what you actually can see if you look to the commits that I left here, right? You can see the evolution of my code through my commit messages. Add, type on left side, custom command. And then afterwards, I moved the custom commands to the right place. Then I shorted shorten the spec file and so on and so forth. Write short commits. Uh, well, this one has already gone. Use alias so you don't need to repeat selectors. So as I mentioned before, not everyone knows and they think that they should extract the selectors into a variable or a different file. But you can actually use an alias like I, I did for the text areas or for the left side text editor, right? You can use an alias and then you can, with Cypress, when you define an alias, you can do sci.get at and the name of your alias, and it will get exactly the same element without the need for repeating the selector. Make use of JavaScript's power. So in this case here, I showed you using for each iteration iterators of arrays, template literals to, you know, interpolate strings with dynamic data from variables. So this is what I'm mentioning here with make use of JavaScript powers. Uh, Cypress uses JavaScript in the end and you can make good use of it to create very robust and very reliable test suites. And finally, be happy and keep testing. Like uh, it's very important that we test the, our applications in an automated fashion because it's very difficult to run regression tests in a manual way if you have lots of tests. So keep testing. And if you do it with Cypress, I'm pretty sure 
you are going to be testing in a much happier way than if you were using a different test framework. Um, let's see if we have more questions. If you do have questions, I encourage you to go to the chat here on Zoom or in the Discord channel. If not, uh, we can leave it here and I would love to, to, to get your feedback. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we still have uh, quite a few people in the room here. Uh, I was wondering since the workshop uh, should uh, could be of three hours and we have finished in two hours more or less. Uh, are you uh, are you okay? Should we finish? Should we continue with uh, some Q and A? Let's see. We have another question here. Uh, could you please go one more time through the fixture session? Oh, for sure. Let's um, let's share my screen again. Okay. And let me put this in here. You mean in the fixture file? This is the fixture file. So the fixture file is a const variable, which I am exporting it so I can use the keyword import in my test file. It is an array and this array starts on line one, it ends on line 188, and this array has 31 objects. And these objects are defined by the opening curly braces and closing curly braces. And every one of these objects have the protractor command, which is used in the title with the template literals, which in this case is browser.get, in this other is element by CSS. Then we have the snippet to migrate, which is the code that we want to type here in the left. Um, let me close this and close this too. Then we have the migrated snippet, which is the code in the right. And then we have the Cypress commands, which is also an array. In this case here, it's like an array of one element, but in other cases, we have arrays of two elements or arrays of three elements like this one, and it could be as many elements as needed, uh, as, as many items as needed, depending on how many items we would have to check in the API section here. Um, let's see what else. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, the way you shorten your code, Oh, you mean you mean in the test file, not in the in the. Let Let's go to the test file then. Oh, it 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 says that. Uh, so it seems that I have answered the question. So, and in any case, if you want to have a look, this is the final version. Oh, we can actually look uh, directly into VS Code, which I have it open here. Um, so we can actually, before we finish, uh, we can go back now to VS Code, look into the code as a whole here, and run the tests once again. Um, so in the beginning, I had a test file that was, I think, 100 lines of, of code, and I had only five test cases. Now I have a test file of less than 55, 55 lines. And, it, and, and I have 31 test cases. Uh, I was able to achieve that by extracting my scenarios to fixtures. And because I am exporting them, I can import them in my test file with the import keyword. Then I have my describe function for the Cypress migrator, which receives a callback function. In the callback function, I have the before each with all the steps that are needed before every test start. So every start, every test starts in a clean state and in exact same state as the previous. So we don't have dependencies between the tests. Where in the before each, a visit slash, which will concatenate slash with the, the, the 
the URL defined as a base URL in my config file. I get the text areas that are inside a div, which has both the VS and the side-by-side -side classes. And I give to these text areas an alias of text areas. Then I get the first one, which is the one in the left, the one that I can interact with, the one that I can clear and type. I press select all to select all the content and I clear it. Okay. And in some very rare cases, it might not clean everything. And so I will change a dot then, which will receive a callback function. For this callback function, I will pass the text area from the left side as an argument. And I'll say, if there is some value for this text area, log in the console that you are clearing it again and do clear it again by wrapping the text area and chaining a dot clear. And then finally, I give to it an alias of left side editor. Um, and then I have, I get my tech, I, I use the text test scenarios that I imported from my fixtures on line one. I get them on line 20 and I iterate over each scenario because I have an array I can iterate over each element of that array, basically each object in that array in this specific case. Uh, and then for the for each function, I pass a callback function as an argument. This callback function receives as argument each of the scenarios, meaning each of the objects, right? Each object will have a protractor command, a snippet to migrate attribute, a migrated snippet, and a Cypress commands property, which in this case will be another array. So I'm basically destructuring all these properties from the scenario as variables so it can access them inside of this for each context, all right? And then I am creating a neat block inside of this for each, meaning that for each scenario defined in my fixture, I will have a specific it test, uh, a specific test, which I use here template literals to print in the Cypress console, migrates protractors, protractor command, command into Cypress, and then I'll get the first command from the list of commands in my array. Uh, and then I do a side.get for the left side editor, and I type the snippet that I got in here. I do a side.contains for a button that contains the, the text, migrate to Cypress, and I click on it. I get all the text areas, and now instead of getting the one in the right, I want to get, uh, instead of getting the one in the left, I want to get the one in the right. So I say dot last to get the last one, which is the one in the right. I scroll it into the view so I can see what is in there. And I run my assertion that it should have the migrated snippet as the value of that text area. And I also, besides this verification here, I also, iterate over each of the Cypress commands, which are in my fixtures. Uh, and because I need not only the command, but also the index, uh, in my arrow function, I encapsulate them into, um, uh, I have to wrap them into parentheses. I transform the Cypress command of that specific index. So in the first iteration, the one on index zero, in the second iteration, the one with index one and so on and so forth. I replace psi by nothing, by an empty string. I replace dot by an empty string and I replace parentheses by an empty string. And then I get the API details div. I check that it should contain the command, not the transformed one. So psi.get, psi.visit blah, blah, blah. And then from this element here, I find all the anchor tags. It might find more than one. So I say, find the one with index zero or one or two, so on and so forth, and check that it should have the attribute href on .cypress.io slash the transformed command, which is the command without the side, without the dot, and without the parentheses. Uh, let's run the tests once again, so you can see them running. And let me see if there is uh, another question here. 
Um, let's see. Okay, so that was great. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. The way you shorten code, it was very interesting. Thank you. Could you advise something about pros and cons of page objects? I still like them in large projects since they allow IntelliSense. I surely can give my, op my opinion, Olga, on page objects. I kind of gave it before, but I'm going to uh, say it again. What's my impression of page objects? Page objects, they were a uh, pattern used, used in, in test automation for you to abstract some ideas, to abstract the definition of elements and how you interact with the elements in another module, which could be a class, for instance, that you could instantiate new instances of that class. And then if you have many different tests or even many different test files that need to reuse those same elements and actions, you wouldn't need to duplicate them all. What is the problem? Of du that, that's okay. You are, then you were following the drive. Don't repeat yourself, right? But there is one very big problem on doing this. And the very big problem is that you are over testing your application. I'll give you an example. Let's say we want to test, uh, I don't know. Let's say we want to test uh, type form, for instance, which is uh, a product uh, that I work for, for this company, right? So it's a product where you can create uh, very nice forms to you know, collect leads, for instance, okay? I want to test that I can uh, log in. So I would have a test case that would visit the login page of Typeform. It would type my user. It would type my password. It would click in the login button. And it would wait for the login to happen and assert that I was successfully logged in. Great. Now I need to create another test case. And this test case is that I can create a Typeform. But as a precondition of creating a Typeform, I need to log in. I need to be signed up. I need to be uh, logged in, basically, right? I cannot create a form if I'm not logged in before. So I would have to repeat the steps of logging in. So I reach the state where I can now create a form. And then I would, you know, click, visit the page that uh, allows me to create a form or click a button that will direct me to a page. And then I will interact with the fields in that form to create and check that the form was created. But I have already tested login through the graphical user interface once. So doing all the same steps of signing up, of logging in through the UI for the test of creating a form is a waste. I'm over testing. I'm passing again through the same, like the application is executing the same lines of code again and again when they actually have already tested that thing. And if it's passing, it you know that it works, okay? If it's not passing, uh, then it's broken. And if it's not working, all your other tasks will break because no other task will be able to execute because login is broken. But let's say that actually what's broken is uh, just something in the front end. Maybe after you fill the, the, your username and password with valid information, the button, is not doesn't get enabled, which means that you can click on it. But the backend logic is still working, okay? Uh, so this means that all your tests would be failing when actually the only feature that is broken is logging. And you are not able to test that you can create a form anymore because you can pass through the logging page. But if and, but let me tell you, if he, and, and, you, and what if you had an option to still authenticate and reach the state that you want without going over the UI, creating a mechanism for signing in through an API call and setting some cookies in the browser that would that the browser would think that you are authenticated. And then if the login is failing because the button is not getting enabled, you would have only the login test failing. And you would, all, you would still have all the other tasks that require the user to be logged in 
passing if everything else is working. And because you are testing, you are authenticating for the tests where logging in is just a pre-requirement, because you are authenticating via an API call, for instance, instead of going through the UI, there is no need to abstract all the element definitions and actions for the login page in a page object because they are only used in the login test file, you know, only in one place. Uh, and, and that's just an example. You could have, for instance, in my intermediate course, for instance, of Cypress, which is available on Udemy, you, I teach you how to test a very complex application, GitLab. So we set up a, a, a local version of GitLab using Docker. And, and then after, uh, besides logging in uh, with GitLab, you can, for instance, I can create an issue or I can close an issue that is already created. Okay, so let's say I want to test that I want to close an issue that is already created. There are two ways I could do it. There are surely more than two ways, but let's let's think about it as two ways. One way is I can log in through the UI, and there are some preconditions before logging in. After logging in, I have to create a project, and then for this project, I have to create an issue, and then. With an issue created, I can go there, visit the issue, and click close button and check that it was closed. So you can see that there is a lot of steps that I have to go through to reach the state that I want so I can test what I want, my target, which is I can close an issue. I already have a test for logging in, so there's no reason I should be logging into the UI again. I already tested creating a project through the UI. So I'm over testing if I am doing that again through the UI. I already have a test for creating an issue. I just want to test that I can close it. So in my intermediate course of Cypress, what I teach you is the side of request command and how you can mix API testing with graphical user interface testing where you can create all the preconditions via API calls, which are much faster than doing things through the UI. And they give you this, they separate the things. Like if, if it's only the front end that is broken, but the logic in the back end is still working, you can still test other scenarios that don't depend really on the front end, you know? Uh, and when you reach that point, you don't need all these abstractions like page objects, because in the end, you are only using these specific selectors and actions in one file, and you don't need to extract them to page object. That's my opinion. Um, and, uh, and, and using a request is just one option of optimizing your tasks. There are lots of other options like using app actions, like uh, uh, things that the application exposes to you through the browser API that you can manipulate and create state in your application without going through the UI. Uh, in my advanced course, I also te teach you how to test the front end decoupled from the back end, where you test from the end to end just once to ensure that the connections are well connected, let's say. But then for the rest, you mock all the API calls with static files and you test all the different scenarios using static files. And you can even then test things that would be difficult to test end to end, like what happens if the server is down? You can test that using side of intercept, for instance, uh, which is something I teach on my advanced course. Uh, but uh, you would not be able to test that in an end to end way. You cannot say, you know, now shut down the, the API here because I want to test uh, uh, a false scenario, you know? Uh, and there are many other ways, like uh, I saw once um, a presentation, um, a webinar, where uh, these guys, they, they had a web application. Uh, their web application consumed data from a server that was written in Python. So they had a Python file that they could execute to create the whole state in the application. So you would, when you start the application, always ready for you to start testing and you test your, and your tests are very objective. They are very to the point. They don't do everything through the UI. They just go to where they have to go and they do what needs to be done just once. And they ensure that everything is working. And Cypress has the side of exec command that allows you to run uh, 
things in the in the as you were as if you were running things in the command line. So you could just run a Python file to do everything for you. It would wait for it to finish, and then uh, it would uh, you, you would get all these advantages of test optimizations that I'm saying here. Um, we have another question for, from Olga here, which is, what are the goals of refactoring? You say a lot about shortening of code, but nothing, for example, about test maintenance, code simplicity, code should be easy to understand. Well, actually, Olga, I think I have said a lot about simplicity, maintenance. Like, as, as you can see here now, maintaining this test here is just looking into one specific file. If I have to do some maintenance, I don't have to go anywhere else. If there's something wrong with the test, it's only here. On the other hand, if I want to create a new test case, I just have to add a new entry in my fixture file. file. So it's, it's very simple. Uh, this thing here might not be the easiest to understand if you're not reading into Cypress and JavaScript, but then my uh, advice is get deeper into Cypress and into JavaScript because test automation is writing code and we need to understand how to make good use of the tools that we are using, not only the frameworks, but also the languages so we can write very robust, robust code. So uh, I, I see a lot of people coming from manual testing into automation without having a code uh, a programming background. And I highly suggest that you do understand three things before you start automating, thing, automating your tests. The first one is understand HTML, the basic tags that are used in most of the applications that we see in the web. The second one is CSS selectors. You have to understand how to create good selectors to identify uniquely your elements. And the third one is learn the programming language that the framework that you use uses. If you don't know these things and you try to move from manual testing into test automation, you will write poor quality tests, okay? But if you do know how to use the tools and the language, you make good use of them. So that's my take here. Um, really great demo. Thanks. There's a lot to learn here. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have any experience with Cypress component testing? If so, does this architecture also apply there or only end-to-end -end tests? I do have uh, a not a lot of experience with uh, component testing, but uh, let's see here. If we go to my website and you go to YouTube, you'll be directed to the English content playlist of my YouTube. In the English content playlist of my YouTube, I have this talk here, Cypress Component Testing uh, from the Test Automation Talks. So this is a content that I have in English about component testing where I'm testing a React application. Uh, and uh, yeah, feel free to take a look at this one. So my website is valmir.dev. This one here, I'm gonna send it in the chat so you can have access to it. Then in the footer, in the in the header, you can go to YouTube. You'll be directed to the English content chat, and then you can find this one about component testing. If you speak Portuguese, you can find in, in another uh, playlist also one in Portuguese, which is kind of the same of this one, but, but in Portuguese. Let's see what else. Um, uh, why do you use site.get data? Something should contain command find a equal index and not cited contains. I data something command. Let me see. Let me see if I understood it. So in here, index. It's, let's see. Okay, I got it. I've got what you mean. So you were saying that in here, instead of doing 
uh, find a index. I should do sidehat get uh, data test blah, blah blah comma and then the command. It's because I'm running two assertions in just one chain of commands. The first one, I'm just checking that the API details have the command, which is sci.visit open and close parentheses. But then from there, I can still, when I'm in this should, I still have access to this sci.get. So from this one, I can chain it find to find all the anchors. From them, I can get the one in the first index, the one in the second index, and then verify that the href attribute has the correct value. This is why. You can clone the project, Olga, download in your computer, try what you, what you think it would work, and you see that uh, it will not work because, uh, because I'm running two assertions in one chain of commands, actually. Uh, I hope that makes it clear. About page objects, your login page sample is about usage of page objects. Uh, not sure, not sure. The, the point with page objects is that that's my impression, okay? My impression is that people learned how to do test automation of graphical user interfaces in a way before Cypress. And then they tried to apply the same concepts to Cypress when they should not. And they should not because Cypress is very, very, very different than the other test frameworks that we had before. So what I like to say is that when you are coming to the Cypress world, to the Cypress side of the force, you should actually forget some of the concepts that you have learned and apply the new ones with the new architecture and with the new power that Cypress gives to you, okay? If you try, it's the same as simply trying to translate uh, Protractor from Cypress. It's not how it should be. There, there, are, there, are new, uh, there are new things into Cypress land that didn't exist in Selenium, for instance. And if we try to apply the same concepts, they won't, they won't work greatly in the Cypress land because Cypress is completely different. It has a completely different architecture and a completely different way of writing tasks. That's my take here. Um, I would disagree with this example of page objects is valid. It's okay to disagree, don't worry. GitLab testing sounds interesting. Feel free to go to my website here and go to courses. In courses, you find my Udemy profile. I have courses of Cypress in Portuguese, but I also have the intermediate course in English. The course, um, the basic one in English here and the, uh, the, the one of visual regression testing with Cypress and Percy. There is also the ones with the US flag are in English, the ones with the Brazilian flag are in Portuguese. So in English here, we see that uh, I have the advanced, intermediate and basic. In Portuguese, I have more than three. I have besides the basic, intermediate and advanced, I have also good practices, test and so on and also the, the, the visual regression testing, which is available in both languages. Um, let's see, what else? Logging page sample is about don't do test preconditions via UI. There are backend requests and DB requests for this. Yeah, actually I can deploy UI without backend to some environment just to test that's happening if backend isn't available. Correct. I log in through the UI because the login is with third party app, WordPress. Do you think this could be possible without the UI? Um, it depends on the APIs that uh, WordPress would provide you with. So it depends really on the authentication provider that you are using. Uh, there are, for instance, ways to authenticate with Google without going through the UI if you are using Google as an authentication provider. I don't know about WordPress, um, but even if you need to go through the UI, then I would recommend you to, to learn about uh, session command which is a functionality that was, that was introduced not very long ago, which allows you to cache the session. And you can even uh, 
share this session across the spec files. And this allows you to log in through the UI only once and then cache the session. And when you try to execute the site.login again, it will ask Cypress, do I already have uh, a session in the cache? Oh, yeah, 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 you already have. So restore the session for me, and then you reach the application already logged in without having to go through the UI more than once. So I would highly recommend going through the Cypress documentation is great. When I first uh, discovered Cypress in 2018, I kind of, I, I read it all. Nowadays, it would be very difficult to read it all because it's much more dense than it was, but it was already dense. But I felt so impressed about the way you can write tests with Cypress that I decided to read all I could. So I spent a few nights reading the documentation. And this is why I say that Cypress is very different because I really read all the documentation and I know its details and I know that you can do things differently than you were used to. Um, okay, side out contains, find. Well, uh, feel free to, to, to do what you're mentioning there, Olga, and uh, work my project, create a PR, and, and, and let's see if it works. I would be glad to, to review your code and, and, and have it uh, merged if it works great and if it's simpler than what I showed you. Marcus, would you recommend doing API tasks with UI tasks, or should they be separate? Um, I recommend both. I recommend you run your graphical user interface tasks with Cypress. You can also run your API tasks with Cypress with the Cypress request. Uh, there's even a nice plugin that was created by another Cypress ambassador called Philip, uh, which is the Cypress plugin API, which allows uh, you to see what is going on in the API uh, when you are running side of request, you don't see anything here in the right. So this plugin allows you to see which verb was used, what was the URL, what was the status of the request, uh, and you can see the response, the headers and the cookies and everything. Um, I actually have uh, some, I have done two live codings on my YouTube channel in Portuguese, unfortunately for you that don't speak Portuguese about this plugin here. So I recommend you using Cypress both for uh, end-to-end testing for API testing. You can use it for component testing as well. And if you do use for API testing and you use for UI testing, you can also mix them both to create what, I'm, what I call optimized tests, where you do all the preconditions through API calls. So you don't waste time doing everything through the UI. You don't waste time over testing your app. And then you do through the UI only what you need to do through the UI. So I highly recommend uh, doing that, Marcus. Hope that answered your question. Any more questions? We still have uh, 25 minutes. So if you have more questions, we can keep going for a little bit more. If not, we can wrap it up. Um, up to you. What do you say? Thank you, Clary. Thank you, everyone who attended the workshop. I hope it was um, it was helpful information. And if you didn't understand it all, don't worry. The recording will be available uh, soon, uh, so you can watch it again. And because it's being recorded, you not only will be able to watch it again. But you will be able to pause if you are in doubts of, of something, and then you can go back and forth. So if you want to watch with like a faster speed, you can do lower speed as well. So wherever you prefer when the recording is available. Let's see, there is uh, another one from Marcus. Do you know any good materials regarding app actions? I know this can be good alternatives to page reviews. Uh, there is the, the famous blog post from Gleb about uh, do not use page objects with Cypress, uh, which he wrote in, uh, yeah, it's stop using page objects and start using app actions. I think this one is great. Um, it's dense, very dense. I have read this document here uh, a while ago, 
and I even had uh, helped one of my mentees to translate it to Portuguese. So there is even a Portuguese version of this one here. I highly recommend reading this. And when you read this, you will understand why I do understand that we don't need page objects anymore when you use Cypress, because we can make use of all the power that Cypress gives you out of the box without you having to install any extra thing. And even if you do, Cypress has a huge ecosystem of plugins that you can add to it to do more stuff. So yeah, highly recommend reading this one. Oh, all I said, labs post is really hard to understand. Then I think it really depends on uh, the the maybe about the, the the amount of knowledge you have both about Cypress and about JavaScript. Again, as as I said before, before trying to dive deeper into task automation, we have to know the basics. We have to know HTML. We have to know selectors, and we have to know the language, the framework we are using uses. So if you do know these three things, I would say that uh, understanding this kind of thing wouldn't be that complex. Uh, if This is why in my YouTube channel, uh, I created playlists called uh, JavaScript for QAs and CSS selectors for QAs because I think they are very important concepts that people that are moving from manual testing to test automation, they don't know. So I say to them, go through these videos. They are free first before trying to automate because there is where I give you the basics, the foundations. Um, unfortunately, the, the content is, is all in Portuguese. So if you don't speak Portuguese, then I would recommend you finding uh, a very good uh, source that I would recommend is Codecademy, codecademy.com. Uh, they have lots of free courses and they have of course about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, everything that you might imagine. Many of their courses are free, so I highly recommend. Understand the technologies that your framework uses before trying to use the framework itself. That's my recommendation. Um, is there something easier? Yeah, I would recommend like uh, follow uh, the, the ambassadors uh, group on Discord, uh, and you can ask questions there. There are many more people that could help you out. Um, but uh, yeah, when I read this blog post, I kind of, I, this is when I understood it. So to me, it's it's not that difficult. It's dense, it takes time, uh, but it's 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 not that difficult. But uh, yeah, I highly recommend uh, looking for other resources as well. I also struggle to understand his explanation of this, even though I love his content. Thanks for recommendation though. Yeah, so the point is that uh, sometimes you can make your application, your, your application actually exposes some things to the browser. And that's one of the powers of Cypress. It runs in the same browser as your application is running, different than Selenium that has a web driver server in the middle. So you have to write tests that send the commands to the web driver that sends commands to the browser to automate things. Cypress is running together with the application in the browser, which means that you have access to everything that the application itself has. And so you can, for instance, Get, grab the window object of the well. Actually, I have, um, I have a content on my YouTube, also in the English channel. Let me see if I can. Oh, let me just uh, hide this floating panel here. So, in here, I have also, uh, as I said, some interviews. One of them is with Philip, another Cypress ambassador, stories and ex experiences of a tester and Cypress ambassador. I highly recommend you uh, watching this video here where in, in a moment, uh, in, in a specific moment in the video, Philip and I, we discussed this, uh, the not need of page objects and how you can still achieve great things with Cypress. And recently I watched uh, talk uh actually it was on test js summit um i watched history i watched this talk here from philip full circle testing with cypress philip creek test js summit 2022 
it, it doesn't mention necessarily uh, page objects, but uh, it's it's a content that I highly recommend because uh, you understand the kinds of things you can do with Cypress that maybe would just if, would help you understand why page objects would not be uh, that necessary when we are talking about uh, Cypress tests. Let's see what else. Um, have you used app actions in any of your projects? Yes, I, I did uh, in some uh, pro in some projects, uh, especially at work. Uh, and so they are not like public repositories. I can show you them. Um, but uh, there is one course in Test Automation University, Automation University, oops. Automation, Automation University. There is a course called Advanced um, Cypress something. Let's see. Cypress. This course here is for free from Philip, Cypress Ambassador, learn, learn advanced concepts in Cypress. He teaches uh, very briefly app actions, if I'm not mistaken, in this course. Highly recommend it as well. Um, Maria, from what I read, it's just official Cypress recommendation to not use page objects, but it just depends on what you want to do and how you write tasks. People do use page objects with Cypress. I'm not telling you, you should not use it. I don't use it. I don't recommend using it because I think there are different ways and better ways of writing Cypress tests, but I don't discourage you. If you think that's that works for you, it's fine. What I recommend is that you don't you overuse, over test your application. Uh, if you do over test, then uh, it's a smell that, uh, let's say it's a smell that you could improve something in your test suite. You could optimize some state creation in your application somehow. Uh, in, and, and then I think you should try to address those. Also, from my understanding, page object is not completely the same as Cypress Actions. So again, it depends on what you do with your tasks. I mostly just use them because it's easier to store and update the selectors when they are in one place. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, of course. Yeah, again, Maria, it's what I said. The thing is that if you are, if you are having to store selectors and actions for your page in a different file because you are using the same selectors over and over in different test files or, or in different test cases, there is a smell that you are over testing your application. So you should think about better ways of test your application without having to go through the user interface again and again for things that you have already tested once. That's the point. Um, yeah, Maria also found uh, an article on Apple Tools blog. I like the article about the question. So thanks for sharing that, Maria. Is there any other question before, before we finish this? Um, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see Zoom and see what's going on in here and put this in here. And let me open the chat once again. It seems that we have no more questions. So I want to thank you everyone uh, for being here today. If you haven't had the chance to watch it all, don't worry. It's been recorded. It's gonna be available soon to you. I pretty much liked giving this workshop to all of you. So I hope you liked it too. And I hope you learned at least one new thing that will improve the way you write your tasks. And yeah, thanks a lot. See you next year, probably on Test.js Summit. I'll be there for sure. And I hope you are there as well. See ya.